This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. My guest today is Brad Thor. He is the author of 21 novels, 20 of which feature his protagonist, Scott Harvath. His latest, Black Ice, is available now everywhere books are sold in hardback, in ebook, and audiobook. And I certainly would not be in the position that I'm in today without Brad Thor. And I will be forever grateful for that. If you go to the acknowledgments in any of my novels, you will see that I thank him profusely. And in this one, my third novel, Savage Son, I dedicate to Brad. And I write this for Brad Thor, without whom this post military chapter of my life would not be possible. And to those who run to the sound of the guns. So, Brad, thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And uh, for those of you listening or watching, if you like the conversation, be sure to leave a five star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Helps counter some of those big tech algorithms. And now, without further ado, the great Brad Thor. Brad Thor, thank you so much for joining me. This is so awesome. You know, so I don't know. I don't know how to start this off. I'm just so excited. Um, because none of this would be happening. I wouldn't have a podcast. I would not have books. My family would not be in the position that we're in following the, our time in the military uh, without you. So um, I owe you so much. I owe you everything. And uh, I'll never forget what you did for me, what you did for my family. And uh, thank you for opening this door for us. Jack, listen, you're welcome. I, I'm the son of a United States Marine, and I really believe that there is no American dream without brave men and women willing to protect and defend uh, our way of life. So I can do what I do. I spent time writing books that you were reading while you were downrange, and I was able to do that because you were willing to do go through everything, go through buds, go downrange, all that stuff. So I'm extremely grateful to you. My family's extremely grateful to you and all of our other brave men and women uh, in the military and law enforcement, in the intelligence community. So, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a good buddy of mine who is a fifth group guy. And he, you know, we talked a lot about service and my dad was really serious. My dad said, listen, if you guys want to go into the military, me and my brother, he said, okay. But he said, I want you to understand that one of the reasons that I became a Marine is I wanted to advance you know, our relatively new to America family on that kind of American dream. And he said, you guys want to go do it? I mean, I got into a little bit of law enforcement stuff back in Illinois, but it, we've always felt such a, a, a tie to the military. And one of the things when I had this talk with my fifth group buddy was he said, Brad, somebody had to pay for the bullets at Lexington and Concord. <laughs> you know? That's right. He's like, everybody's got a role to play. So as long as you don't forget that you have a role in this relationship, it's not you're over here and the military's over here. We're all together as Americans. So. Oh, no, it's amazing. Amazing. And I love when you talk about your upbringing and your dad and great Santini. And you had that, you had, yeah. a, you got some discipline from that. You had some Marine discipline from an early age from that guy. I was sitting on this zoom waiting for you to show up because my dad always <laughs> taught us. If you're not early, you're late. That's right. You were right on minutes. time, on time, on target. So good for you. I was That's early. Right. You were right on, right on the dot. <laughs> 30 seconds plus or minus, you know, on target. And then, uh, yeah, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're already later. One of those, you know, type of things. That's the, that's the Marine Corps yeah. way. But, uh, yeah, this, the way this all came about and, and also you know, things are busy these days. Things are crazy. And it's wonderful to have these issues, but I always love when my, when that phone rings, I'm always like, Oh geez, who's it going to be? And when I see you pop up on there, boom, I love it. I, that, that makes me so, it makes my, my whole day shifts. And I'm like, Oh, let's go. I li absolutely love that. Cause a lot of the other calls coming in today, there are a lot and I'm figuring sure. out how to juggle all this and prioritize and put how to say no and that sort of thing. Right. That becomes the hardest thing in the world is how to say no. And I can't remember, I think it was on one of Rogan's podcasts that I was watching and it might've been Rogan himself that talked about all of the pies. He, he didn't use it as pies, but he kind of, I think he used the analogy and, and forgive me, Joe, if you see this and it wasn't you, but I'm almost positive that it was him. And he talked about all of the things he was into. It was like a really long planter bed. And he was planting stuff and he had to manually water things with a watering can, had to go do it by hand. And he said, if I keep saying yes to things, the planting bed gets longer. And then I can't get to every single thing in the bed with water. And so things atrophy and they wither. So I would imagine that's one of the things with all your success that you're having to, you want to say yes to everything. You want to help everybody out, but you really kind of have to pick and choose what you do say yes to. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of but turning into the, the hardest thing for me to do because I keep saying yes and I keep uh, you know, the emails 
more of those requests keep coming in and it's great problems to have. I feel so, yeah. so fortunate. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm figuring out the process now, uh, as far as yeah, time to write the book, time to return those emails, time to return those texts, time to do the business side, like all that getting more disciplined in the day and in the approach as I, as I move forward here, but you need uh, a bad guy. You need, to, you need to hire somebody that can, <laughs> all that stuff feeds through one person in your org and they have a decision matrix and they only bring you stuff once it's met all of these things. And then you get to, you know, you get to reserve the ability to, to fob it off on somebody else and say to even pals, and I'm sure you've got tons of people that are coming out of the military now that are looking for help and you want to help everybody and you just can't. It doesn't make you a bad guy. It doesn't make you ungrateful. But sometimes saying no is the best favor you can do to somebody. Because they've got to go back and improve whatever it is they're doing. They've got to find another way in. It's tough. It really does become, because you want to pay it forward, right? Yep. You want to, I mean, Vince Flynn was so kind to me when I was a nobody in this business. He and Nelson DeMille. And, you know, so that's why when when I got introduced to you by a mutual friend from the SEAL community, I was like, guy sounds awesome. Let me talk to him. Oh. And, you know, but all I did in, for everybody watching this, Jack is incredibly kind, is incredibly humble. I opened a door. It's all I did. I, I said, listen, this guy's a great guy. I said to Emily Bessler, I said, will you read the manuscript? You know, you would not have made it if your stuff wasn't so damn good. You know, I mean, when I gave you the blurb for the first book, I was really serious about what I said about it. So just understand, I appreciate this and I really appreciate you, but I want everybody listening to know this isn't just because I made a phone call or I made an introduction. I opened a door and at that point, Jack Carr had to step through that door and he had to seal the deal and boy, did he do it. They were really impressed with him. And the proof is in the pudding. You know, Clancy used to say, anybody can write one book. Can you write the second one? Can you write the third? Can you write the fourth? Now the fifth. <laughs> That's so right. you're doing it. You're doing it. Very few people can do it. And you're one of them. So congratulations, Jack. Oh, thank you so much. And it was so cool. So uh, it, it, a mutual friend, Johnny Sanchez, who now yep. who's in, in finance at the time when, when you met him, I think he had uh, transitioned from the SEAL teams. Uh, and now he runs a, a company called Team Performance Institute out there. Such, such a great guy. And, sure, uh, yeah. and you got to know him. And uh, when he found out that I was writing a novel and this is what I wanted to do in my post-military life, uh, he said, hey, have you heard of this guy named Brad Thor? Have I heard of this guy? Yeah. Yeah, I think I've heard of him. I've read all this stuff. And, and, uh, and he said, hey, would you like to talk to him? And I was like, would I like to talk? Would he talk to me? You know, like I was, I couldn't even believe it. And he said, well, yeah, let me, let me, let me ask. And, uh, and for him, but it goes back to if I hadn't been, if I'd been some sort of a, a D bag in the SEAL teams with a horrible right. reputation and uh, like he wouldn't have risked his political um, uh, capital by calling you and asking if, uh, if you would spend a few moments of your very valuable time uh, to talk to me. And, uh, and he did that. And you said yes. And I still have my notes. We're in the middle of a move right now. So uh, I still have my notes from that call. And I'm not sure if I ever told you this, but I was at the, I was up in LA and I found the corner of a parking lot and I parked my car there and it was an old Land Cruiser at the time. So it was very loud in those old 80, uh, 88 Land Cruisers. So I turned it off. So I didn't have any air conditioning going and the sun is just beating down on this thing. And I have my yellow legal pad there and I'm ready to take notes and I'm there way early just uh, for the call, ready to go. And I still have that because I found it during the move and it's in a box, but there's sweat marks all over it. But I have all the things that you told me during that call, which was amazing. And you spent you know, like 45 minutes with me. And it was like a job interview. Uh, and I think you wanted to find out if I wanted to write for the right reasons. And mm -hmm. uh, I told you about my upbringing and my mom being a librarian and having this passion, this love of reading my whole life and it being that one other thing other than being a seal that I wanted to do. And eventually you're like, okay, stop talking. Uh, <laughs> if you write this thing, uh, you know, I will let my publisher know that it's coming. And uh, yeah. that was, that was all I needed. And you said, uh, when is it going to be done? And I said a year from today. And then I called you back a year later. Yeah. But, you did. Uh, and, but you, and you know, what's so cool is uh, you've, you've mentioned me, I've mentioned you. And so what's fun is I'm getting new readers because they've heard you talk about me or you were so kind. You, you dedicated a book in part to me and that's, yeah. that's led people this way. Uh, you know, whenever anybody asks me, okay, Brad, I've read all your books. Who should I read? And I'm like, have you read Jack Carr? Oh. You know? And so it's nice because there is a certain amount of competition in this industry, as I think there is in any industry, but largely I find with writers, they're all very collegial. They want to help each other out, right? Because there's 365 days in the year. Somebody could buy all the Jack Carr books, 
all the Brad Thor books this year and still have time to read them and still have time to go buy others. So it isn't like if somebody buys your book, they're not going to buy mine or vice versa. There's, it, it's just, it's a neat part of this industry is that we don't have to box each other out. We can actually all help bring each other along and, and then help new guys, the guys coming in behind us. Yep. No, exactly. And it's not what I expected coming from the SEAL community, which is uh, very competitive. And then I just thought, you know, that when you go into anything in the private sector, that uh, that it's going to be a competition, um, but maybe not necessarily a competition for a team because you're coming from this team background in uh, in the military. And then I thought people were going to keep me at arm's length when I got into publishing and and it was going to be very difficult. And it was the exact opposite. Exact opposite has been true. And uh, people have welcomed me with open arms and it's been incredible. But on that call, you told me one thing that helped so much. Uh, and you said, give yourself permission to write a bad chapter. And for whatever reason, that like that freed me up from this worry of, hey, what if this chapter is not good enough as you're going along and to have that be okay? Like it was, if, if it's not good, hey, you know what? You can edit. It's not like you're on the battlefield making a decision. And if you make a bad one, people are going to die. You can sleep on it. You can come back the next day. You can't edit what hasn't been written. And that actually, that, um, you know, it's, it's funny, the similarities between you and me, as far as, you know, I had family in Coronado. You obviously spent a ton of time down there with the SEAL teams. I ended up in Park City for eight years. My kids were born just down in Salt Lake. Um, when we moved from Park City to Chicago, we my wife was the doc for the U.S. ski team, and she had a chance to go back and be a doc for the Bulls and the White Sox in Chicago. And we wanted to be closer to our families in the Midwest, so we moved back. And I moved into a house, see, you're going through a move now, that the renovations weren't complete. And I was writing this intense book. I was writing Takedown at the time, and I was having a lot of writer's block. And that piece of advice I gave you it was the first time I'd ever had any writer's block. It was just so much pressure and so many things going on. And I found that piece of advice in people who know writing quotes will know who said it. But it was, a, I believe, it was a, a woman who's an author who said, give yourself permission to write a shitty first draft. And uh, that can be, you know, you can break that down to just a crummy chapter because you're right. You can come back to it the next day, but you can't edit what hasn't been written. So uh, there's that other thing that said, if the, if the tap's not open, the water don't flow. Right. So you got to sit down at your desk and open the tap. Oh yeah. And for whatever, that gave me, that, that gave me this, uh, this freedom to sit down and write it and lifted a huge weight off my shoulders as I was going forward. So hearing that from you was uh, helped me so much along this path. So I try to pass that on to, to other people when they ask me about advice. And, uh, and also what was great when I was coming in is that I didn't have a Facebook account. I didn't have an Instagram account. I didn't have, uh, I didn't have any of that sort of thing yet as a distraction. Cause I was still in the as a seal. You don't set this up. You don't do that as a seal. <laughs> they might hey, now, they might now in third right. phase. It's possible. It's possible. Along with the writing classes and the, you know, the, the, the interview technique courses and that sort of thing. But, uh, but yeah, back then, look at this guy was, I caught planting a bomb next to the side of the road and giving them nookies <laughs> on your Instagram. Quick, yeah. Quick, <laughs> quick, get a selfie, uh, yeah, document it. But it's so different today that I think people would be thinking about that sort of thing a lot more. Uh, whereas I just had to think about the book. And, uh, I think in that I'll call, you also told me that, Hey, for nonfiction, you, you do, you, uh, you can sell a chapter, you can sell an idea, you know, that sort of thing for fiction, it has to be done. And so when I talk to people today, that's what I tell them, Hey, get it done. Don't worry about marketing. Don't worry about a website. Don't worry about any of that thing. Get it to be the best that it can possibly be. Uh, and then move on to that next stage and find that agent, find that publisher, whatever you're going to do from there, but get it done. And that's the other thing you told me when I called you back a year later, this was the best part because I was done. Like, whew, made it. I made my time. I made my, made my, my first deadline. Uh, it's a, uh, like the day before I called you, boom, it's done, Brad. And then uh, you said, Hey, is it as good as you can possibly make it? And I said, well, I could probably go back and read it a couple of times, <laughs> maybe edit it a little bit. And uh, you said, okay, call me back when it is as good as you can possibly make it. So I spent the rest of that summer, uh, late spring through the summer to the fall, getting it as good as I could possibly be. I got it to that point where if I worked on it for another 40 years, it would get better by a degree. Nobody and noticed the difference. Yeah, exactly. So, cause you could do that. People could keep doing that forever and making it better. And yeah, they probably would make their manuscript better if they spent another 40, 50, 60 years on it, but by a degree, and then you're never getting published. Uh, so you got to get it out there and get it to that point where you're, you're comfortable and you are happy with it. And then, and then I called you back and said, it's as good as I could possibly make it. And you said, all right, let's do this. I'll let Emily know it's coming. And, 
off we went to the races. It's the key. Um, so I had to, I had a couple of meals when I'd go to Minneapolis to do a book signing or whatever, I get together with Vince Flynn. And I asked him if he would ever go back and like take a book after it was published and want to take another crack at it. He said, you know, there gets to be a point where it is like a degree that you drive yourself crazy because you can find 10 different ways to rework the opening sentence. And it just keeps mm-hmm. going, going, going. And he said, you know, if, if you're batting such that you're about to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, why would you start messing with your swing? That was his other thing, too, is, you know, you don't necessarily need to change it up. I don't know how much I agree with that. That that was intriguing for me, particularly when I was a younger writer, this idea of not trying to improve your swing if you know you're going to the Hall of Fame, uh, because I think writing is a craft where you can always get better. And so when I'm not writing or researching a book, which is most of the time, I'm reading books about writing. I'm constantly trying to get better uh, because I think this is a this is one of those businesses where the more you read the different kinds of things you read, the better you get as an author. I, I You cannot be even a halfway decent author without being a voracious reader. Oh yeah. That was it. That was what gave me that essentially that master's degree or that PhD in, the, in the thriller genre what was reading these things growing up was having that mother who's a librarian and growing up surrounded by books and a love of reading and knowing I wanted to go in the military. So finding everything I could on the nonfiction side, even when I was seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, and then where's that next step? Where do you go? Oh, well you go to books by guys like Tom Clancy, by Nelson mm-hmm. DeMille, by A.J. Quinnell, by J.C. Pollock, by Mike, Mark Olden, guys who had protagonists with backgrounds that I wanted to have in real life one day. So I'm thinking, oh, Nelson DeMille must have done some research on these guys. And, uh, oh. and it says here in the background here that he was in the Army for a few years. Oh, great. So that became some of my my research and inspiration to further go down my path. But it also gave me this, this Ph.D. in the thriller genre, which was, uh, which was amazing. And I think it would be different if you just woke up one day and decided to, hey, I'm going to try this writer thing out. I'm going to go back and read David Morrell, Brotherhood of the Rose from back mm-hmm. in the early 80s. And through this lens of everything that has transpired over a lifetime now and all the biases and filters and all the rest of it. So I feel very fortunate that I grew up reading uh, in the genre and studying the genre, even though I didn't realize I was studying it. I was just enjoying it. But uh, but that, uh, that, that certainly is yeah the most helpful part of being a writer is being a reader first. And that's what Stephen King says, is that you should write what you love to read because that's where your passion is. And I've always gone that extra step and used the term PhD. You actually have a PhD in the genre because if you've been reading your whole life there, you know, particularly with authors that have uh, repeat characters, why books really worked for them. Or maybe you got to their seventh book and it was a clunker, but you love the first six. You know what he did different on the seventh. And so you can avoid what that author did. You can learn from that. So you really do. I mean, PhD is a great way to, to explain it. You really do develop a PhD in the genre if you are a voracious, voracious reader in the genre. Yep. No, exactly. And like with anything in life, we always want to get better. We always want to evolve. Uh, in the SEAL teams, I didn't get to a certain point and be like, oh, look, I'm good. I've graduated SEAL qualification training. I'm good now. No, it's constant learning, constant adaptation, constant evolution. And, uh, and speaking of evolution from, from, your, your, from Lions of Lucerne up through today, how has your process evolved or, or how has it changed for the, uh, to become more effective, more efficient? Or how has that evolved over the years now that you're on your 21st novel? The twentieth that uh, that uh, features Scott Howard, right. of course, but yep. uh, twenty-one novels over uh, uh, over the course of these years. What has evolved over time as far as process? Uh, process it definitely technical uh, knowledge has improved. I mean, I, it's really funny to get somebody who comes across like a first edition of Lines of Lucerne, uh, which was published uh, months after the 9-11 attacks, and then wants to send me an email telling me about technical things I got wrong. I'm like, thank you, sir <laughs> or madam. First book. Yeah. yeah no, yeah. believe me, I have uh, I have. Uh, broaden my knowledge of all sorts of things since then. So the neat thing is with this stuff is that there are certain things that haven't changed, whether it's trade craft, whether it's things that happen in the diplomatic world, there's always going to be these power struggles, these power dynamics, uh, people who, uh, yeah, human nature doesn't change. And so that's kind of an interesting, consistent thing through throughout the novels. Uh, early on, I got uh, two big, huge pieces of fan mail right off the bat from both sides of the political aisle. One was from Newt Gingrich, who said, I'd really nailed the threats to America and America's enemies. And then one was a uh, had been a cabinet member in the Carter administration who said, I nailed Washington, D.C. insider politics like nobody else. 
And I just took man's worst nature and dropped it into DC and didn't, you know, hoping it wasn't that bad. And apparently it is that bad, but um, (laughs) process worse. Yeah, it could be worse. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) So process wise, what I always, I always look at books as it's show and it's business. Okay. So we're competing with Netflix. We're competing with, you know, uh, the internet, the internet wasn't as big of a thing when I was, when I was starting out, it was really ramping up. But so there's a lot of things that are competing for people's time. And I always tell people, I don't work for Simon and Schuster. I work for the readers. They're my employers. When they go to Amazon or Goodreads and leave X amount of stars, that's my annual performance review. And I really want to make them happy. Uh, so when I, my process has changed in that, I think my writing's gotten tighter, short, crisp, cinematic, uh, chapters. Uh, I, you know, if you go back and read a book like Lines of Lucerne, it's, it's a fun, fast read, but there's probably six or seven different storylines going through there. And, uh, you know, that it all come together and tie up at the end. And that's changed for me. I mean, I saw what Patterson was doing and it's, it's smart to look at success. That was always a Tony Robbins thing that if you sow the same seeds, you'll reap the same rewards, but you'd be silly not to look at people who are successful, particularly more successful than you at any point in your career in a genre and see what can you take from them? That'll make your writing more commercial, commercial, more successful. Let's put it that way. So my process, I've tried to streamline stuff to really make it so it's impossible for somebody to put down the book. I never want to give them a point where they're going to put it down and maybe not come back to it. So process wise, that's probably the biggest thing. But I've looked into, and you've got this with James Reese. One of the, one of the challenges with writing a serial character is you don't want James Bond to be any different at the end of the movie. You don't want Indiana Jones to be any different at the end of the movie. You don't want them sitting around holding hands, talking about their feelings, drinking <laughs> constant comedy. You don't want that. But you do want to reveal a little bit more each time to the reader. So they feel they understand your protagonist a little bit more. So that became part of my process over the years is how do I reveal a little bit more? So my character, Harbath, grew up on Coronado because his dad was a SEAL. So what was it like when his dad wasn't downrange, when his dad was home? What did they do together? Did they go into San Diego? Was there a particular movie that got played in downtown San Diego? And they'd go and see it seven or eight times. And how did that impact Harbath's? Uh, development and his view of the world. So that's the kind of stuff over the years I've I've worked into the into the books and the characters. Yeah, but that's something else you told me when we first talked. You said make every chapter as good as the first. And uh, but then you also said, but don't get too hung up on it. Uh, so so I love I, I love that. I, I think about that every day as I'm as I'm writing. Like, how am I ending this uh, to make the person want to go to that next chapter? And then how am I ending the whole book, make, giving enough resolution where they've invested this time, whether they're listening or they're reading, uh, that they they feel they got that resolution from spending that time and investing it with the character and with me and trusting me with that time. Uh, but then I still still want the next book. Still leave that one little bit that just wants that next book. So and that's resolution. Smart. That's say. smart. And the time is the time is critical. And I'm glad you said time because this is something that I talk about all the time in podcasts and when I'm at writers conferences and stuff. Someone can go out and make another $15, $25, whatever format they're buying in. They can go out and make more money. The one thing that they cannot do after taking a flyer on your book is they can't make more time. So it is incumbent upon you to give them the absolute best you're capable of because the time that you're asking them to trust you with is time they could have spent with their families, working on their business, working on another hobby, reading someone else. So if you always respect the reader's time, if you make it worth their while to read that Brad Thor or Jack Carr book or listen to it if it's an audio book, then you've really honored your commitment to them. If they walk away wanting to read the next one, then that's icing on the cake. But it's really important. That's that's the big thing with my you know, Midwestern Marine Corps dad is that you show up every day on the job like it's your first day and you never forget that if you don't work your ass off, it could be your last. Oh, exactly. Exactly right. But at that, that time piece is what I think about every day as I'm going through the manuscript or I'm editing or I'm writing something new, whatever it might be that, Hey, this person is trusting me with that time that they're never going to get back. And that's a, that's a big responsibility. Um, and I take that quite seriously. I take that. Uh, that's the, the most serious part of uh, this profession is, uh, is being a good uh, custodian of that, that trust. So, uh, and so in this one is, 
is uh, the Magnificent Seven. Is that your your favorite movie? Did you go watch that with your dad, or is that a something from the? Uh, no, it's a it's a big one. It's one. No, it's a big one, and it's one that we really like. And I thought that, yeah. that fit Harvath and his dad very well. Uh, I watched it with my dad, so I was reading that. I'm like, oh my uh, goodness! I remember watching it with him, and we watched it just a few years ago when I was in Coronado, and he came by uh, the house, and we watched uh, it late uh, one uh, one night with a couple beers, and uh, had a great time, and kind of remembered when I was a kid watching it together. So it was one of those ones that he uh, he shared with me when I was very young, and we got to revisit that together later on when I was nearing the end of my time in the SEAL team. So, uh, so I loved seeing that in here. Us, t- us too. So that was a, that was a big, uh, you know, we weren't like, uh, football was big in our house. Baseball wasn't. Um, and baseball is one of those ones where if you get a dad and son to both love it and they like the box scores and all that kind of stuff, it becomes a shared language. But mm-hmm. for us, it was, uh, my dad's got a really good sense of humor. My brother and I joke and call him the great Santini. He's not like the great Santini. You know, I'll get together with my brother and he'll throw like, it will be at a diner and he'll throw a pack of sugar at me and be like, who's my favorite daughter and stuff nice. like this. It's, it's, it's always this kind of stuff, but yeah, it's kind of neat when you have cultural touchstones, uh, mm. between a father and a son that that's neat because sometimes the movie can say things that your dad maybe can't say, or there's lessons in there that your dad thinks are important that he wants you to get. I do the same thing with my kids, right? So there's movies that I want them to see. I can't always get them both to sit down at the same time with me and I might have to see it twice. Uh, but if I'm showing them the movie and I think it's important, I don't mind watching it twice. You know, I'm letting yeah. the movie do the talking because at some point they stop listening to us. They listen to their friends. When they get to a certain age, your influence wanes pretty quickly. Yeah, and just like you said with, uh, with readers today, we are competing against every app on a phone, on a smartphone, not just an internet, but every app, every, every Netflix, every Amazon prime, like all these distractions, every text, every email, all Mm -hmm. these different things, every FaceTime, every YouTube video, that's a lot to compete with. And same thing as parents, we're competing against those things for our our kids' attention. And they're, they are distracted by all these things. Then when I want to sit down and show them a movie, I've run into this. I want to show them this movie that even when I was young in the eighties, my dad was showing me this movie from the sixties or the, or the seventies that I thought was old back then but there weren't all these other distractions. So I'd sit down and I'd still could love that, that film. And I have that problem with our kids. They're like, uh, when's, when is some CGI magic going to appear? You know, they're so used to this dig- living in this digital realm, even as much as I try to make them put those things down or force them by going in a river trip into a river Canyon. Uh, so you're not going to be, ha- have any cell service for a week or any no Wi-Fi certainly, or we go on a hunt or something like that where there's no cell, no Wi-Fi. but still when we come home, they're back. And all those distractions are there. So, uh, yeah. so it's tough as parents and as, uh, in this profession of, of writing, being, uh, co- being competitive with all those distractions. And it takes self-discipline to finish a book. So that's the other thing too, that I'm noticing is, uh, what I love is when parents, when families share books. So I've got a lot of readers who say, oh, my dad gave me your book or my mom gave it to me or my sister. And so you find that the discipline to read books. So we were always told growing up that if you wanted your kids to be great readers, you should read to them. Well, in the book Freakonomics, they blew that myth up and they said, while reading your kids is a great way to bond with them, that's not the key to making sure that your kids are good readers. They said through their research, what they found was, is do A, do you have books in your home, number one? And secondly, do your children see you reading as the adult, as the parent? And they said those two factors have even more power over making sure your kids are readers for life than just reading to them each night before they go to bed. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because usually when I when I read, I like to be uh, in a quiet place with good light, uh, not distracted, not being interrupted. Um, but usually that means that the kids aren't around. Uh, and so it's interesting what they are seeing is me doing business on my phone. That is very interesting. I'm going to take that to, I'm going to take that to heart going forward here and maybe start reading in the front room a little more where they see me. Just let them see it. Just even if it's a little bit, it becomes a behavior that they want to model. So, and they might not even know that right away, but seeing you read is very, very powerful. Interesting. I'm going to, uh, yeah, they, I mean, certainly they're surrounded by books. This library is very, fairly robust uh, here. I think I've saved every book that I've ever received or bought over my entire life. So every time we move, it's, it's quite a big deal, big deal. to move yeah. all these books. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. But, uh, uh, but I love it. I, I love being surrounded by books and I, I love being able to go over there and know exactly what I'm looking for, whether it's research or whatever, whatever else, or see, see, I wish I did not give your Lions of Lucerne away in Ramadi in 2006 or 2005, because <laughs> I ran in there in 2005 into 2006 and, uh, it might still be over there. 
because that's the first one I read. And then I read all the others since. Um, but I wish I still had that first one because I have so many of these of the other ones that I read growing up. But that one might still be in Iraq because at the time, you know, team concept. And I hated giving them away. I always I always even though I pass books along to other people in the SEAL teams, I'm always like, I'm never getting this back. I always would, would know because <laughs> right? you, you know, if you're not giving a book to someone else who is a uh, voracious reader and like they don't understand that connection that you have to a physical copy of a book. And so I knew when I gave ones away in the SEAL teams that those weren't those weren't coming back. Um, but yeah, yours is probably still over there in uh, in Ramadi right uh, to this day or it came home like a marine duffel bag or something yeah. like that. Like, who knows where that is? But uh, uh, that's where I that's where I discovered you on the way into probably one of the most dangerous cities in the world back uh, in 2005, 2006. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so now you've been doing this for two decades mm-hmm. uh, and you've been at the top of this, uh, of this genre, at the top of the profession for two decades. That's incredible. Um, looking mm-hmm. back, what's, uh, what was the biggest mistake that you made along the way? Is there one that, that stands out where you're like, oh man, if only I had done something or, or have you always been, ah, you know, make a little mistake here. You know what we can do? we can fix it. We can move forward. I can learn from it. I can share that with my kids so that they don't make the same ones. Or I turn this into wisdom going forward. Or, um, is there anything you look back on that you would have done differently? Yeah, there, there's one thing. So, um, I had, I had somebody in the publishing world who has never given me a bad piece of advice, always excellent advice. And I think when I got, when they gave me this piece of advice, um, it was it, it wasn't bad in their estimation and what they knew about the market in the industry. But I said uh, I went to this person that I trusted who was a real genius in the business, and I said, "Listen, I, I was talking to Kyle Mills about maybe spinning off one of my characters and writing it with Kyle and putting out more books in a year." And I said, "You know, Kyle's a good buddy. I really love because so, I knew Kyle before I was ever an author." So, when for those of you who don't know Kyle, Kyle took over the Mitch Rapp series for Vince Flynn. Uh, just a super super guy. Uh, my family was friends with his family before I became an author. He gave me one of my first blurbs. Just really super guy. I love Kyle. Yeah. Um, and I said, "Oh yeah, I'm thinking about doing this with Kyle and everything." And this person said to me, "I don't know. I don't know that people are going to want to read more than one book a year from an author they like. You could oversaturate." Uh, the marketplace with your stuff. And, you know, this was right, you know, Patterson was starting to get into writing with other authors and all this kind of stuff. And it would have marked, I think the piece of advice was good. I I still talk to this person today. I still love this person. I'd never gotten bad advice. And who knows at the moment, they were giving me what they thought was the best. And I, and I followed that advice because I trusted this person, but that was kind of an inflection point where maybe my business could have really gone up to another level uh, by doing this model of writing with other people. In addition to the standalone book, I would do the Harbath book every year. So, so that's the one thing that I think about if I could go back and change it, but hindsight's 2020 vision. When I said, okay, I trust you. I'm going to listen to you. There was no way I could know, you know, the, if I had gone and done it, it might have been a bad idea. It might not have been good for my career. It might have it might have turned me in another in another direction. So, um, so that's probably the only thing. I mean, you got a whole year to put out a book. It's the joke about record albums, right? Like you get twelve years to work on the first album, and then you've yep. got twelve months for the second one. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always love it when I hear people on um, in. Uh, some people are just bitterly angry when I get like a really bad <laughs> review and I don't get a ton of them. I know you've yeah, read yeah. some of your reviews. Yeah, there are yeah. some people that aren't happy unless they're bitching and moaning about something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, really felt like Thor was on a deadline. I'm like, oh, <laughs> shocker. I'm on a deadline every <laughs> single year. And the one thing that I think is just it actually makes me laugh because it's so ridiculous. Really feels like he's got a formula. I wish I had a formula. If I had a formula, it would make writing so much easier. <laughs> if I knew that this happened in chapter one, this happened in chapter yeah. two, I don't outline. I don't know about yeah, you. Okay. I'm super organic. So like yep. Dan right. Brown is an outliner. I'm not. So, yep. it, it, so it's kind of funny to see that stuff. And I don't know how I pivoted here from, you know, things you I would do differently. Um, but, oh, I know, because I said, you know, you've got 12 months to write the yeah. book and that made me think about all that kind of stuff. So you've got some room to uh, to test things out. You've got mm-hmm. some time. I mean, you and I share the same editor. So, you know, we're going to send the manuscript to Emily. She's going to read it. She's going to say this worked for me. This didn't work for me, blah, 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 blah. So I, I've been fortunate in that I've surrounded myself with really bright people in this business. In the advice I get, I trust these people. And I think 
that I don't have a sack full of regrets because I have assembled a really great team. And that's the key to being successful is finding people who are excellent at what they do. You know, okay, you're the medic, you're this, you're that, you know, I I don't need somebody who's trying to be all five things at once. I want one person and I'm happy to share the success with those people, but that's really key. And like I was telling you before, this ability to say no, or at least have kind of a decision matrix things have to go through. I, I just... Uh, somebody that I work with who's brilliant, uh, who runs a lot of stuff for me, we did a grid the other day, kind of a quadrant thing. And she's like, okay, here are four quadrants. And she said, let's talk about what's on your to-do list. And she said, we're going to place it in each one of these quadrants. And she said, now I'm going to show you which quadrant is the most important. You only focus on this quadrant and that one. If you've got time for the other two, that's great. But these two big things, the books and Hollywood, that's it. Those are the most important. Everything else is way down the line. Yeah, well, I, have, I have an interview with someone in a couple of days to uh, hopefully take on some of that that role for me. So she's a, a former Army logistics officer uh, here in Park City. So Perfect. Um, I'm hoping, yeah, I'm hoping that uh, that that works out because I definitely need a little help. But the team is amazing. Emily, incredible. Uh, my agent, incredible. And she stays. I mean, she. I thought my only inter, my only experience with agents was uh, watching Californication. Uh, you know, David, <laughs> David Duchovny. Duchovny. Yeah. yeah. And so that was my experience with agents. So I thought that was kind of how agents are. And, uh, and my agent, no, she sticks to what, you know, she, she stays in her lane and she is awesome at it. Um, so it's definitely not like the David Duchovny, Californication agent relationship going all that, but Emily is amazing. My agent is amazing. David Brown, our, uh, David's our, our, our shared publicist is, uh, is amazing. So this team, I feel so fortunate. Um, but also when people ask me about those positions, I said, well, my experience is very limited. Uh, It's limited to one agent, one editor, one publicist. I have no other experience in the, in the industry. In the last week, I've had two people come to me with memoirs saying, you know, Mm -hmm. can you point me to an agent? I'm like, I, I, I I know one agent. That's not what she does. You know, and it's funny you should talk about Californication because before that was even out, my, my image of what an agent was came from a movie with Tom Selleck and Paulina Porzakova, where he's a, write, a frustrated writer yes. called Her Alibi. Such where he a sits great in movie. the back of the criminal court, <laughs> uh, courtroom looking for good stories that could maybe spur him back into writing. And his agent is there supporting him all the time through, through all his difficulties. <laughs> so it's funny how via Hollywood, we, uh-huh. as people who haven't been in the publishing business, invent the idea, the image of what an agent is. Oh yeah. I'm gonna have to go back. I haven't watched that since it came out in the eighties, late eighties, I think for, uh, for her alibi. Um, I'm gonna have to watch that. I'm gonna force my family to watch that with me. Um, and then when you look back also, do you look, you have these different moments that you, you see as, Hey, wow, this was a like most successful point. Like, was it getting that first novel published? Was it that first conversation with Emily was, is it that first publication day when you saw, Oh wow, this, this my character is connecting with people. People are investing, uh, in this character and they want more. Were there certain points along the way that, uh, that you view, look back on as, wow, that was a very successful moment for me or that endeavor or that time that I devoted to this particular task or this particular year, uh, or this particular novel. Um, wow. I'm sure glad I did that because that propelled me along my path. Uh, yeah, I mean, the first, the biggest one was I had been, uh, I'd had my own TV show nationwide on public television called Traveling Lights. I thought traveling abroad outside the United States made me a better American. I realized how good we have it in this country by, by seeing the United States from the outside. Um, and on my honeymoon, my wife asked me, what would you regret on your deathbed never having done? And I said, writing a book and getting it published. I always wanted to do that. When I graduated college, I'd saved up money. Uh, I went to the University of Southern California and I had leased apartments in LA, saved money, moved to Paris, uh, and was going to write a novel. And I got a couple chapters into it and I quit. I was in, I, I said, oh, what if nobody likes it? You know, I had that little voice in the back of my head that said, this might not be good. You might not sell it. It'd be embarrassing. Why risk the embarrassment? Just don't take the risk. Just do something else. Travel on the money you save. And that's what I did. I chickened out and I shipped my laptop back home. And I'd always wanted to be an author since I was a little boy. Um, and then our, on our honeymoon, my wife asked me that question. I said, writing a book and getting it published is what I really want to do most in life. And she said, okay, when we get home, start spending two hours, protected time every day, making that dream come true. So that's great. So we had a little more time on our honeymoon. Uh, we were overseas and we shared an overnight train compartment. I had spent a month of traveling in Europe, trying to change this train ride. So we could have a single compartment, not a shared compartment. And my wife said, you know, we're spending more time in all of these train stations waiting in line to get up to the window to try to change its reservation. She said, you're ruining our honeymoon. She said, you got to just let it go and it'll be what it's going to be. You know, and I've, I've been in enough 
trains where, you know, there've been gypsies trying to cook on a hobo <laughs> stove or muggers oh, yeah, yeah. and stuff like this. And my wife had never traveled overseas before. So I wanted her to have a good experience. Anyway, it was, we had been at Oktoberfest in Munich and I had an Oktoberfest size hangover dragging our bags to the train station the next day. And I was just dreading what this overnight train ride was going to be like to Amsterdam. And we got in the compartment and it was a lovely brother and sister from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And they were big fans of my TV show because they loved to travel. They recognized me right away. We had a great night. And I sat up most of the evening talking with the sister about our shared love of books. Her name was Cindy Jackson. And uh, she said, blah, 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 blah. What are you going to do when you get home? Are you filming more episodes of the TV show? And I said, actually, I'm going to write a novel. I figured I admitted it to my wife. The more I talk about it, the more it's going to kind of cement it and make it happen. Mm -hmm. We talked about books a little bit more. She's like, oh, you've got to read this guy, Vince Flynn, blah, 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 blah. See if you can find. So I'm like, she's a huge reader. Uh, We get into the train station in Amsterdam the next morning and we go to exchange business cards. And she goes to give me hers and she kind of hesitates. She said, listen, if you write that novel, I'd like to read it. And if I can help you out, I want to help you out. She handed me your business card and she was a sales rep for Simon & Schuster. And all these years later, I'm still with Simon and Schuster. And it's because of that overnight train ride with Cindy Jackson and her brother, Rob. Uh, that, that was a big, big moment. So, I, you know, I went home. Uh, I wrote the manuscript. Two hours led to three, led to four. Trish kept the world at bay for me, would bring me food in my office. Uh, and I, I got to the end of the manuscript for Lions of Lucerne. And I felt like what somebody must feel when they run their first marathon, climb their first mountain. I knew I could do this again. And I also knew I would never get to my deathbed, having wondered how would my life have been different if I would only had the courage to see uh, the writing all the way through from start to finish. So I love that. And I love that story. And then, yeah, I'm the yeah the beneficiary of, uh, of that, you know, moving forward down the line. Uh, it just, gosh, just incredible. Uh, but I think about you know, sitting on your deathbed, when I, when I read some of these reviews sometimes, and I, you know, and I do go, I read the Amazon ones. I only have time for the Amazon ones. I don't look at uh, any reviews anywhere else on Goodreads or on, uh, on, on uh, YouTube or anywhere else. It's just the, just the Amazon ones. Cause that's the only really all I have time to, to skim through. Um, but I often think about, Hey, is this person going to be on their deathbed saying, I wish I had just left one more negative review on Amazon. <laughs> you know, I wish I'd put another paragraph under that five that I spent telling this person how horrible they are. And, and how horrible they hated their book. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, you can, what I like about Amazon is you can click on that person and see all they do is leave negative reviews. And you can yep. be like, all right, this, this person is yep. just unhappy. Yeah, you know, I've done that a few times. And then like sometimes I've clicked on a couple and it takes over and they're reviewing. I'm not like the only book, but it's all these other strange like kitchen appliances and other exactly. things. And they're all negative. But they're your like, blender <laughs> sucks. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's really it's funny to, to read that. <laughs> it's really funny to, to do that. But, you know, it's uh, for me, it's about turning a, a negative into a positive, which is why I read those uh, it's, on, it's, in video. It's free market research. You know, I mean, you'd be any author who says they don't read their reviews is either lying or incredibly foolish. So you've got to have a thick skin to get beyond those ones where people are just just you can tell they're just unhappy souls. But you get such valuable information out of those reviews, what people like and even when they tell you what they don't like. And if you get more than one person that says, I don't like this, doesn't mean you got to change, but you should think about it. And so it really is free market research. It's like having the suggestion box, you know, near the door of your business. And if people want to give you ideas, suggestions not ideas for books, I don't take any outside ideas. But if there's things that again, these are the people you and I work for. I know Emily's going to hate me saying this. Uh, you know, we don't work for Simon <laughs> Schuster. We work for the readers. But ultimately, those are the people. This is the other thing in our business. Is I'm constantly saying to uh, the folks that we work with, that you and I work with, is that as authors, we're customer service. Nobody reaches out to Simon and Schuster with an issue. You know what I mean? So yeah. and this is what especially the today. No. Yeah. And the one thing, and it's not a, it's not a publishing related thing, but you'll get a one-star review if somebody's book comes dented from yes. Amazon. It's Everybody gets those. The the book. Yeah. So, yeah. My page yeah. was missing and they, yeah. it's like, well, you could probably return it. Amazon would be happy to send you, you know, That's another $7 and 99 cent paperback. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're more than happy to just probably, you know, if I don't even have to send that one back, they'll probably just send you another. But, but I did something similar. 
you do you do deal with people like on your Facebook page and things like this. People do come up with stuff and they ask questions and all that. So it's funny. I've kind of developed this customer service mentality. I'm very interactive on Facebook, and I realize that no, they're not going to reach out with certain questions to Simon and Schuster or whatever, and they are going to come to me. But that just deepens the connection with with yep. the reader. And if you can help oh, yeah. them with their stuff or answer their questions, so that's a that's a, a piece of my day that I always carve out and protect so that I can get on Facebook and interact with the fans and then deal with yeah. anything that might come up. Yeah, but that's something you couldn't have done in 1975, 85, 95. Uh, obviously, for an author, uh, you were just more reliant on your publisher to do certain things for you or not. Or do the fan um, mail. Mm, I mean, that was yeah. the big thing is that the mail would go to the publisher and then the publisher, you know, once a month, whatever, would box up all the fan mail and send it to the author. But you had And you had a barrier there. So uh, same thing with reviews. <laughs> Back in the day, you would have to, if you hated a book in, let's say, 1985, you would have to, uh, one, read it, uh, to find out, okay, this is a paper or a magazine that uh, has letters to the editor. Now right. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write one, either longhand that someone can read or type it. Then I'm going to find the address. I'm going to address an envelope. I'm going to put a stamp on it. I'm going to send it. That letter is going to have to make its way through whatever you know series of the bureaucracy yeah. going to get to this person's desk. They're going to then have to open it. They're going to have to read more than the first line. And then they're going to have to actually put it into the magazine or the newspaper, like barriers. Now, zero barriers. <laughs> the, democra the, the, the democracy in the digital world is a good thing. And sometimes it's 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 yeah. not. And so you you just have to roll with it. It is exactly. what it is, right? Exactly. So. What can you do? But I did something similar between my second call to you when I said I'd call you back a year later, uh, which I did. Uh, and then when you told me to get it as good as you can possibly get it, I sent it to about 20 different friends, trusted agents uh, that I thought would give me good feedback on it. And before I sent it to these 20, maybe it was even 25 back then. Now I, now I don't do that anymore. But uh, for that first one I did, and I said, okay, if uh, one person says they hate something in here, I'm discarding it. If two people, I'll think about it for about five to 10 seconds. Yeah. If uh, three to five of these 20 to 25 people say the same thing, then I'm going to take that to heart and I'm going to reread this. I'm going to think it through uh, and I'm going to contemplate changing it. So uh, similar with, with reviews, I guess, if you have these, uh, these negative ones and you know one person says something crazy, but if a uh, hundred people say something crazy out of 20,000 reviews, well, maybe that's something too and much. You know what? Bad. You will never get to the point in your career. And I'm a perfectionist and I, I gave, I, I let this one go a long time ago. My wife uh, in high school was a lifeguard and the pool was either too cold or too hot. Nobody ever came up to her and said, it's just <laughs> perfect. So you're right. always going to have, no matter how great the book is, you can pick like your favorite book. Like uh, what's your favorite novel of all time? It does Once, not an eagle by An Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer is, okay. uh, is probably not reading in 1968, which is really a, an anti-war novel, but uh, because of, if you look at it through the lens of the time it was written, but um, it's historical fiction, follows two guys from pre-World War I up through Vietnam and juxtaposes their, uh, their, their time in the profession of arms. And it's really a case study in leadership, even though it's historical fiction. So that's, uh, that's probably my, yeah, probably my number one most recommended and most uh, gifted book, probably. Okay, so the one that I give away the most and that I love the most uh, that's nonfiction is the Brenner assignment by uh, mm. Patrick O'Donnell. This thing is incredible about an OSS uh, Jedberg team going in trying to blow up rail lines in Italy, and it's just have it right over thing, there. Do you, it should be a movie. I mean, it's incredible the, the the romance with the Contessa and just the frostbite and the and the Restrapos, these these big sweeping come into a village, the Italians and the Nazis to to try to get all the partisans and all the Americans, and they would go through every building and turn over sugar cans to find these people. That book I think is fantastic. It is it is that and in the Garden of Beasts uh, by Eric Larson uh, about the rise of Hitler in the 1930s seen through the eyes of the US ambassador. Nobody wanted the job uh, to go to Berlin, but this guy from the University of Chicago took the job and was very at rose colored glasses on. It, uh, two fabulous books, okay? I love both these books. I think they're perfect. In fact, in the Garden of Beasts, I always claim there isn't a single error. Emily's husband was the editor of In the Garden of Beasts, but I guarantee you these two Fabulous books, Brenner Assignment and In the Garden of Beasts. If you go to Amazon, these are brilliant books. Yes. I'm a writer. They're fucking brilliant. I guarantee yes. you there's a collection of just unhappy motherfuckers <laughs> who are like bitching about both of these fabulous books. And it's just the nature of the world. Yep. 
Yeah, no, I've done that many, uh, many a time. Is uh, when I uh, is to go to some of the, my favorite books on on Amazon and look. And you're sure exactly right. There are these <laughs> hor- horrible reviews on there for these amazing books out there, and that does give you, uh, you know, it, it lets you take a breath and be like, okay, you know, it's all right. Look at this amazing book. And this thing called can't. the Bible is too long, <laughs> too, too long, many writers, too confusing. I don't know who- edited this thing. <laughs> yeah. I give it one star. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who is yeah. the editor on this thing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love those ones. Oh, hilarious. Um, but, uh, so we're winding down our time here. I know you're, you're, uh, I'm really respectful of your time. Um, what is ahead for you? And this is coming out by the time this comes out, this will have came out yesterday. Uh, okay. so this comes out, uh, Tuesday, the 20th of July and, uh, black ice right here. Amazing. Uh, Thank you so much for sending me the early edition. Oh, people. Welcome. This is called a, uh, a galley copy. Uh, so I didn't know that until I got my first box of galley copies before my, my novel came out. But, uh, but yeah, this is the galley. So I got to read this early. Uh, fantastic. Amazing. Just like everything else you do, you always move you. the ball forward, um, which goes back to evolution as a writer, um, it, getting better, oh. uh, studying the craft, always getting, getting better. Face the um, bar each that's time. It. That's yep. exactly, exactly it. And you certainly do it with Black Ice as you do with all of your novels. Uh, and I know you always tell people that they can jump in anytime, that it's like a it's James, like Bond, James movie. Bond movie. You don't yeah. have to go back. Yeah, you don't have to go back to Dr. No to, oh, yeah. uh, you know, enjoy the latest one. Uh, uh, but, uh, but and you don't for, for yours. And I, I noticed that in particular in this one, um, because these days I, I read in the genre less and less because I'm so busy um, and I'm doing most a lot of research. Uh, so as, whereas I grew up reading all these novels nowadays, uh, a lot of times I'm reading them for, for an interview, uh, ah, for, for sure. the podcast, for sure. ask me for yeah. a blurb, um, something, something like that. So it's, so it's work to read these, but, um, in doing that with this one, uh, I couldn't help, but, but notice how you can 100% jump right into this without having any sort of a background, uh, with Scott Harbath, with the character, with his, his evolution as a, as a character, as a person, as an operative. Um, so I took that, it, so, uh, so I took that on board, uh, cause for, cause for mine, I'm trying to figure out how, how to do that. How much background do people need? I, what, I uh, that's, that's, that's really important. I actually learned something by the, uh, Scandinavian writer, I believe Norwegian Joe Nesbo and Joe yeah. Nesbo has Harry hole is his repeat uh, character. Terrible name. <laughs> I don't like Harry hole is a, as <laughs> a name. I always got it. That was a little <laughs> tough. Uh, but he actually had to describe the background and he did it by having Harry walk through Oslo, walking past buildings that he used to work at. So he nice. did one thing here, did one thing there. Or he remembered the case that drew him to this book. And it was an interesting way, as opposed to having him stand in front of a mirror and you see his description, right. these kind of tropes that writers fall yeah. into. And so you've got to, each book has, there was a piece of advice from Emily, you know, you, you want to do this as a series, but each book you have to, assume, you don't want anybody to walk into the bookstore and see Devil's Hand by Jack Carr and then realize, oh, wait, there's three that come before it. And I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't pick up this one and the store doesn't have the other three. All right, I'm going to go buy a James Patterson book instead. You don't want to lose that sale, right? So you have to do just enough to get the new reader on board quickly. And you don't want to have your, you know, your longstanding readers uh, fall asleep because you're telling them stuff they already know. So that's a Yeah, no, exactly. I think I'm going to get better at that going forward. And up to this point, all the books have been so connected uh, that that's been hard. So when people ask me that question, I always, I say, no, go back and get the first one. I just can't, because you, you have to get to know the character. So I'm so, you know, invested in this, uh, uh, but I'm taking advice from, from you and I'm going to get better at this going forward, uh, especially as time progresses and things move past the initial um, actions and what happens in that, in that first novel that, uh, that make James Reese, what he, what he is. Um, but, uh, but for this one, um, how, how, when did you start this one after the last one? Do you start the next day? Do you just, uh, uh, you finish one and start the next little, one? I need a little, I need a little downtime. I mean, my stuff is very, you, you know, like about to happen in the real world. I, I call what I do faction where you don't know where the facts end and the fiction begins. I've been very, for the last couple of books, I've been really concerned about NATO and about uh, the strength of NATO and getting, you know, Sweden's kind of half pregnant. They're kind of one foot in NATO, one foot out. They're not officially NATO. Norway's all the way in. 
Uh, Norway shares a border with Russia. And so the RAND Corporation did a study about how easily Russia could pick off the Baltic NATO members and the Finns wouldn't cooperate. So anyway, I find this part of the world, Scandinavia, at at the present moment, really, really interesting, uh, just because so many things, the Chinese involvement above the Arctic Circle with the Russians and all this kind of stuff, and that's black ice, is China's gotten so deep into the Arctic with the Russians. and, And Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State, admitted we were really behind the power curve there. Uh, we've got one functioning icebreaker. The Chinese have a bunch. The Russians have like a whole freaking armada. And it's insane how behind the curve we are up there and how much is it at stake. And that's kind of what I, I wanted to set this cool spy thriller uh, in that part of the world, because I want people to have a great beach read, toes in the sand, book in the hands, short, crisp cinematic chapters, as we discussed. Uh, but if you could, if you could, if you have a great white knuckle thrill ride, I've done my job as an author. If you walk away understanding a little bit more about some of these things in the real world, whether it's how this agency works or this geopolitical issue is important to you as an American, then I've done my job as a citizen. So that's 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 the cherry on top for me. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I I didn't know about Chinese influence in the Arctic because most of my research as of late has been into Chinese influence in Africa, uh, that sort of thing. Into the, they the made a lot of Africa. bets in Africa. Yeah, the whole Belt Road Initiative and what they're doing and why they're mm-hmm. pushing into these different areas. They are long term strategic thinkers. We think oh, yeah. one election cycle at a time. Exactly. And think, uh, or our, our deepest thinkers think eight years ahead. Uh, most well, everybody else is four years. Uh-huh. Um, but, uh, and I didn't know about the icebreakers when I read that and hear about how they have uh, these nuclear powered icebreakers. And we have we have one, maybe it's diesel power, whatever it is, but it's broken down all the time or wh- whatever it is. Uh, that was amazing to read in here. So I learned a lot from this as well. Just with the new administration, they wanted to do a freedom of navigation operation and go up over Russia. And uh, they had to tell the administration, we can't do it. We've got one icebreaker. And if we're trying to show force to the Russians, we don't know that this icebreaker won't break down and then we'll need Putin to help us get it. So yeah. we had to call that off. It would have been a really good show of strength to the Russians, but because we're so ill prepared in that area, that's changing. We've ordered a bunch new, a bunch more icebreakers. But so this stuff is fun. And when I could put in my sexy Norwegian spy, Solvi Kolstad, uh, who's just as good as Harvath, probably even better. I joke that the only thing Harvath has on her is experience, and that's only because he's been in the game longer than she has. But she's just she was part of the all female uh, Norwegian Special Forces team, and I, so. I, I knew my female readers would love that character and they did, but the guys went nuts. They're like, you've got to give Solvi <laughs> Kolstad her own book. So nice. to have Harvath with Solvi Kolstad and have him equally matched and to have that set against just this gorgeous, gorgeous country and bounce around a couple of places with a lot of intrigue. That's I, I loved reading those books. And those are the yep. kind of books I love to write. Exactly. Yeah. Write what you love and, and, uh, and that's what you do. And that's what, uh, what I do. And I feel so fortunate that, uh, that you gave me this opportunity to, to be able to, to follow this passion and, and do what I love and I'll never forget it. Um, but what's that, what's ahead for, for you moving forward here? If you're looking out, let's say not just next book wise, but you're looking five, 10 years down the line, are you, are you thinking that far ahead or what do you see on the, on the horizon after this, uh, 21st novel? So we've got, uh, so I just did a new contract. There's been a lot of that going on. I know Kyle did one. I don't know where you are right now with them. And if you've made anything public, you don't have to break news here oh, yeah. on, on the don't podcast. <laughs> but uh, Two more, two more in the works. Yep. Yeah. So I just did a brand new contract with them. I know Kyle did one earlier in the year, if I remember correctly. So, uh, so I've got uh, four more books coming with, uh, with Harvath for Simon and Schuster. We have finally, uh, put all of our negotiating to bed with a studio in Hollywood, which is great. We've had a lot of options done, and um, but this deal, uh, options that didn't come to fruition. And my entertainment attorney just said, you know, all that heartache of this, these particular deals didn't happen because maybe the executives changed. And so they wiped the slate and started clean again at, at someplace. Uh, it's all worth it. We've got, I got to pick the director. I got to pick the writer. I mean, it is, it is incredible. And the executive producer is super successful. And when he said, pick the director, I'm like, bullshit. I'm like, really? Don't even pick the director. He's like, yeah, who do you want? I'm like, and so I went, I went for the best absolute top guy. And he's like, okay, when do you want to talk to him? I think he made it happen. So, I mean, this guy is nice. unbelievable. So we're just waiting for the studio to prep a, uh, a release so that uh, that we can talk about it. But it's mum is the word. We're not allowed to say anything until the studio says, OK, we've got the director and the writer and the EP and everybody's contributed to the press release and it's ready to go. So awesome. so that's a big thing. We're, we're looking forward to getting uh, Harvath uh, 
out in Hollywood, and then yeah. we'll see uh, we'll see what happens. It'll still be a book a year with Harvath, but I'd like to get some more books in the pipeline too. I would like to be doing mm. more stuff, especially with the lockdown. I found you know I probably have the pacing right now that I can keep the quality of Harvath up and do a second book, even just me. Uh, it's the idea's got to be right though, and so that's kind of right. where I am now. Got it. Got it. No, I love it. Love everything that you that you have going on. Uh, congratulations on the, on the Hollywood piece. I'm so excited to, to see you, Harvath come to the, uh, to the big screen. Or, too. When or, do you guys debut? Uh, so sometime in the first half of 2022, I think okay. you know, there's not an exact date out there yet. Uh, that's my best guess. Um, but who knows really when they look at all the other projects they have going on, who, who knows, uh, but, uh, finishing up filming here over this next 30 days. And, uh, Great. yeah, I've seen the first few, uh, few episodes. Cause there's like a director's cut, there's a producer's cut, there's a, an executive's cut and all the, everybody gives their notes and I give my notes and it goes back and it's, it's, uh, I could not be more, more thrilled with, uh, with how it's going. Um, good. yeah, good. two more episodes to film and it's, uh, yeah, it's looking pretty good. Awesome. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I wouldn't be happening without you. Wow. Yeah. Chris Pratt might not have a job if it wasn't for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> So he owes you. <laughs> oh, that's that's funny. Well, I'm just so happy for you and your family, and you know, and thank you for 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 everything you did to keep all of us here safe and to preserve this way of life. That's I, my family and I will always be in your debt and grateful to you because, like I said, there is no American dream. There's no Brad Thor if there isn't a Jack Carr willing to go out there and 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 do the this nation's most dangerous business. So thank you, Jack. I really appreciate you, and I appreciate your uh, just. It's so nice to be friends with you, and I. Love when I call you up and I'm like, hey, does this sound right to you? Does it sound like BS? What, what about this? And, you know, so I appreciate that uh, that we've got this relationship. It's really nice. Oh, it's uh, it's incredible for, for me. It's an honor. And uh, yeah, thank you for your friendship and support and uh, for making all of this uh, happen for uh, for me and my family. So uh, it means the world. And, uh, and thank you so much. And uh, congratulations on everything you have going on. And hopefully we'll uh, we'll link up in person here soon. I owe you some, uh, some very nice dinners with some great wine and bourbon. <laughs> that's the kind of dinners I love. So that's perfect. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, hey, take care. And uh, as always, reach out if you need anything. All right. Same here. Thanks, Jack. Take care. Bye. Welcome to the gear highlights section of the Danger Close podcast. So if you've been following me for a while, you know that I carry two blades most of the time. Uh, one is reserved just for fighting, and the other one is reserved for what I use it for most of the time, which is opening packages, mostly packages that contain books, but uh, that sort of thing, so that you always know that the one you're going to, if you need it uh, in a survival type situation, in a self-defense situation, whatever it might be, uh, that that one is ready to go and you didn't just open a thousand boxes with it or loan it to somebody who then was cutting wire with it or something like that. So you know that that one is sharp and it is ready to rock and roll. So that in this case, this is a great option here. So Amtac Blades, my buddy Bill Rapier out there, you can find him at Amtac Blades, uh, Amtac Shooting, um, but check him out, check out the website. There's a few different options for blades these days. This is a new one. This is the Minuteman right here. And uh, this one right here has a little fire starter on it. Um, and you can, you can wear an appendix or you can put it uh, in your pocket, which is how I like to carry this one right here. So uh, this thing, very cool Minuteman once again from Amtac Blades. And uh, there's also, this one comes with a trainer and very cool, Bill. He put my uh, serial number. That's my Bud's class number. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, this one comes with a trainer as well. So right there. So if you can get on the range, get in a course with Bill, I highly recommend it. Once again, Amtac Blades. Very cool. And then the other one I'll carry is something, there's uh, a bunch of different folders, uh, maybe a Swiss Army knife, but uh, Right there, this was from Andrew Arabito right here. Uh, my friends at Ironclad Media uh, gave me this one and it says iron sharpens iron. So very cool. But that's why I carry the two blades and uh, why you should too. Now you can do whatever you want. But uh, that's why I carry both of them. So I always know that one is sharp and ready to rock and the other one's available for what I do most these days, which is open boxes of books. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. You can find Brad Thor on the social channels at Brad Thor, and you can find him on the interwebs at bradthor.com for more. His latest book, Black Ice, featuring Scott Harvath, is out now. Everywhere books are sold in hardback, ebook, and audiobook. So be sure and check that out. You can follow me at Jack Carr USA on the social channels and officialjackcar.com on the interwebs. If you like the conversation, 
Be sure and leave that five-star rating and review to help counter some of those big tech algorithms. Until the next time, keep fighting.